As we approach the one-year anniversary of the beginning of the uprisings in Bahrain, uh, we are faced with an excellent time to refocus attention on the kingdom. Obviously, much of the attention in the Arab Spring has been paid to countries like Egypt, Libya, Syria. Uh, but as the situation in, in the kingdom continues to deteriorate, uh, it, it really does demand our attention. Promotion of democracy and human rights has been at the, the core of FPI's mission from our founding in 2009. I know it's at the heart of the work that, that POMED and NSN do as well. And so we could not be more pleased to, to be uh, co-sponsoring today's event and we're, uh, we're um, thrilled that, that you all have given it your attention this morning as well. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce David Mercer of NSN. Good morning, everybody. Uh, David Mercer with Mercer and & Associates and also a board member of the National Security Network. Uh, I'm here in lieu of Heather Herbert, the executive director, and General Paul Eaton, our senior advisor. Um, let me just first mention a word about uh, NSN, which was founded in 2006 uh, to revitalize Americans' national security policy, bringing cohesion and strategic focus to the progressive national security community. We're dedicated to developing innovative national security solutions that are both pragmatic and principled. As a member of the board, <clears throat> we believe in countering emerging threats by draw drawing on the best traditions of American foreign policy, a strong, flexible military combined with shrewd diplomacy, the effective use of alliances, and more importantly, the unwavering commitment to American values. NSN works with a broad network of experts to identify, develop, and communicate progressive national security solutions. One of those major experts uh, being Senator Wyden, um, who has been a leading advocate of reform and human rights in Bahrain since last fall when he took the lead in introducing a resolution tying a major arms sales package to the substantive, substantive reform needed on the ground. Since then, he's continued to engage on the issue signing numerous letters regarding international NGO access to Bahrain. He has stressed that the U.S., quote, should not be rewarding a regime that has fired on peacefully assembled protesters, indiscriminately imprisoned its citizens, simply for voicing a political viewpoint and stifling basic human freedoms. With that said, Senator Wyden, <coughs> Ron Wyden, Democrat out of Oregon, was first elected to Congress in 1980 to represent Oregon's third district, and then elected to the Senate in 1996. He earned a BA degree with distinction from Stanford University, and then his law degree from the University of Oregon. In the US Senate, Senator Wyden serves on the following committees, the Finance, Intelligence, Aging Budget, and Energy and Natural Resources. It's with that that I uh, want to have the honor of introducing Senator Ron Wyden. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you here in the, in the Senate. I think uh, you know it really doesn't seem to be a true day in the United States Senate unless you get a filibuster out of the deal. And I guess you're going to have to wait until later in the day to get, uh, to get that because what I thought I'd do is just offer up a few thoughts about uh, where we are, particularly uh, in terms of the recent uh, developments. And I especially want to begin, uh, Mr. Mercer and all those who are part of the project on Middle East uh, democracy because the work that you're doing to continue to highlight what is going on in, in Bahrain is especially important. And also uh, big bouquets for uh, the folks at the Foreign Policy Initiative and the National Security Network for uh, all that they did to help uh, put today uh, possible. So what this is going to be about today is an effort to assess the situation in Bahrain about a year after the protest in the country began and a little over two months since the Bahrain Independent Commission on Inquiry put out their recommendations. Now, it probably is fair to say that it's been a year since the start of the latest protests. For decades, the people of Bahrain have gotten together periodically taking to the streets to demand political and social reform. But this last year has seen 
what is clearly the largest in the series of protests, protests that, as we all know, have been met with government violence. Now, last January saw the highest death toll in Bahrain since March of 2011. So when people tell you, oh, it's getting a little bit better and we're starting to see progress, juxtapose that in your mind. Uh, the largest uh, death toll in Bahrain since March of 2011, last January. Nine people lost their lives and the number of deaths continue to increase as the one-year anniversary of the uprising approaches. Violent clashes, of course, between the government and the protesters continue. Torture appears to be the cause of death of at least one of the protesters. And security forces continue to attack funeral processions, displays of public mourning, and a whole host of peaceful gatherings. Some deaths apparently occurred as a result of the government's excessive use of tear gas. Just a few days ago, on February 1st, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights reported two more deaths resulting from the tear gas, from the inhalation of tear gas. Now, the government has argued that they are making progress in implementing the reforms that were recommended by the Independent Commission. They also point to increasing violence among the protesters as a cause of the clashes with police. Now, there may be a kernel of truth to this. Some protesters, increasingly frustrated with the brutality that they face at the hands of their own government, have lashed out with violence. And there have been efforts, still limited but increasing, to comply with the recommendations of the Independent Commission. Now, I did want to take a moment to say that the king ought to be commended for setting up the Independent Commission. I mean, just picture it. I mean, the courage of allowing such an independent uh, outside investigation and then to sit live on national television while the items, the specific items of abuse were detailed one uh, by one was profound. The commission was not perfect and it was limited in scope, but at least it showed a willingness to be honest about the human rights issues in Bahrain. We need to see more of that kind of conduct. However, movement towards reform has obviously been minor. And my own sense is, my own fear, is that it's cosmetic. They clearly have not gone far enough to indicate that the government is serious about larger reform, much less address the systemic discrimination that continu continues to persist in the country. I'm also worried about the government's practice of turning away outside uh, monitors <clears throat> because this will make it even harder to get a balanced view of what is happening inside the country. Malady that, uh, that they've got. Just a few weeks ago, Brian Dooley of Human Rights First was denied entry into Bahrain. So was Richard Solom of Physicians for Human Rights. These denials came after the Bahraini foreign minister indicated that Bahrain would not deny entry to representatives from non-governmental organizations. So put that in perspective. The public message is we're going to make it easier for entry of NGOs. What actually happened? Denials uh, of entry for important human rights organizations. And to measure any progress claimed by the government, in my view, it's absolutely critical that independent human rights monitors are allowed unrestricted access into and around the country. It has also been disappointing to watch the response from our administration. As many of you already know, the administration notified Congress in September of their plan to sell $53 million worth of arms to Bahrain. This was bad timing and inappropriate given the violence being perpetrated by the government at that time. That's why I introduced a joint resolution that would have prohibited the arms sale from proceeding 
until certain basic conditions, conditions that would ensure some real progress on human rights were met. Several of my colleagues in the Congress and I also sent a letter to Secretary Clinton outlining our concerns about the proposed arms sale. In response, the State Department acknowledged our concerns and indicated it would suspend the sale. Unfortunately, the State Department has realized that it's continuing with another arms sale to Bahrain. The State Department has publicly said that the arms sale includes spare parts and maintenance of equipment for external defense. I will tell you, I do not know all of the items uh, involved here with respect to whether any of them are going to be used uh, against protesters, but I will tell you, I think that sale sends the wrong message. If you're in effect saying, and I mentioned you know, my, my twins, if they're not engaging in the kind of behavior that we think is important for them to be good and responsible citizens, and then you reward them, what does that tell them? And here in this uh, particular case, you're going to uh, uh, see, I think, uh, this particular uh, sale sending the wrong uh, message at a crucial time. The continued violence by the police, continued tear gassings, and continued abuses perpetrated by the government ought to cause our government to use every single lever it has to influence the kingdom. Now, I have had pretty blunt conversations with the senior administration officials that are working on this issue. And I think we all understand that diplomats are in a difficult position in situations like this. But I still want to underscore the fact that continuing with an arms sale, an arms sale of any kind, of any kind, sends the wrong message, it sends the wrong message at the wrong time, and it sends it not just to Bahrain, but to the world. The United States ought to be consistent in its approach to democracy and human rights. Every exception that we make undermines our country's claim to be the true champion of the values that are so fundamental to our country and which we want to convey to the world. Given the explosion of sectarian violence and hatred in Bahrain, uh, certainly there are reasons to be skeptical about the days ahead, and if not skeptical, even further, simply pessimistic. But I also want to come back to the fact that I think it is possible with organizations like yours and people of goodwill speaking out, I continue to believe it's possible to build a new start in Bahrain, the government of Bahrain has the opportunity to allow peaceful protest. That's number one. They have an opportunity to start an honest and forthright dialogue. They can take a step forward without the backsliding that I've described here. The choice is really in the hands of the government. The government of Bahrain can choose peace, they can choose dialogue, they can choose reform. Or they can continue down this path of fear and violence and a path that is sure to lead to frustration. So I am very hopeful that we will see a real progress in uh, the days ahead. Your efforts and the efforts of those around the world to speak out, to ensure that this issue is not swept aside there are lots of other issues, and each one of them is unique. I was asked, you know, coming, coming over here, what is the relationship of this to Egypt? Well, Egypt is Egypt. Bahrain is Bahrain. And that is why it is so important at this particular time that organizations like yours and concerned Americans and advocates of human rights around the world be involved I want you to know that as a member of the United States Senate, as someone who sits on the Senate Intelligence Committee, I'll do everything I can to make the federal government a better partner in these uh, efforts in the days ahead. Thank you for having me. So how there's a concern for the human rights, um, and Obama's mentioned um, balancing 
short-term and long-term interests. Would you argue then that advocating, standing up for these human rights is in the long-term interest versus uh, his stance would be the strategic implications is more in the short-term interest and you have to balance these two? Well, I'll let the Obama administration speak you know, for themselves. I mean, I, I think they believe that they are seeing progress that is not so visible in a variety of institutions in Bahrain. But I'll let them speak for themselves. And I think that that is a fair argument. Certainly when you see progress in one institution uh, or another, that's something that you can build on. What I've tried to do is highlight that while that may be going on, look at what I have described that amounts to what the world and the people of Bahrain are trying to live with every single day. And that certainly, in my view, uh, tilts the scale towards the argument that certainly not enough is being done, and not with the sense of urgency that ought to be conveyed. I mean, when you go forward with an, an arms sale, you're sending a big message. You're sending a message that we're going to be there, and there may be reasons that are important to us, but it certainly sends a message to the government that in some way you're somebody that we're going to offer this particular uh, reward to. Now, uh, certainly the administration will, in addition, trying to make the argument sort of for both sides, will talk about progress being made uh, privately. They'll talk about national security you know, implications in the region, which are certainly uh, serious. But at the end of the day, it seems to me this is still a big, important message, and it happens to be the wrong one. Sure. I'm Brian Dooley. I'm from Human Rights First. I'm one of those who's currently donated access to Bahrain. Um, I wondered in your contacts with the Bahrain government if you sense a real appetite for meaningful reform and negotiation at any level. I, I think there are divisions even within the, within the government, but I, I was struck with this um, very you know, visible demonstration where the king you know, sat essentially in a forum with the broadest exposure you know, possible, national you know, television, listening to what really amounts to a litany item by item, of very specific kinds of abuses. Now, that's something that is different, and something that, and you heard me say, I commend the king, you know, for. But there are obviously differences uh, within uh, those making, making these decisions, and the cumulative effect of, of the policies are still not much progress, not very quickly, and then to see observers um, turned away literally right after the pledge was to open up is not a very good uh, scorecard. You'd introduced the resolution to block the 53 million uh, package, and now you know if the sale is under a million. It doesn't require you know official notification. Is there any? What's the next move that you're planning? What's Congress thinking on this? Shortly after the announcement, I and uh, Senator Boxer and a pretty good collection of uh, House members, uh, both Democrats <coughs> and uh, and Republicans, you know, weighed in. We're going to keep building that group. I mean, we're going to keep building the group that wants to convey that both the actions of the administration and the challenges that I've outlined here today in terms of the next steps are urgent. I mean, certainly there are a lot of challenges around uh, the world, and that's why I mentioned how important it is for organizations and meetings you know, like this to ensure that this retains some visibility. It retains uh, a sense of urgency in terms of what uh, elected officials and our government ought to, ought to be tackling. So I think right now, 
I'm going to be involved in, in two efforts. One, trying to generate more support for our letter, and I believe that we'll be able to do it. And second, I have met with, uh, with Secretary Posner. I will continue to be holding those, those meetings. That's why I want to let the administration speak for, them, for themselves. But I think Secretary Posner's argument would be that progress is being made in a number of areas uh, behind uh, the scenes. I'm willing to acknowledge it. I've made it clear that I think in these areas that are more visible, that are more tangible, that do more to send the kind of message that our country is capable of, of, of sending. I mean, we are the beacon of freedom. And when we're rewarding with arms sales and, and the kinds of statements that, that, uh, that have been made, uh, this, this behavior, I, I think it sends a, a, a message that is wrong at its core. And that's what I'll be working on. I better run off the budget committee. Y'all are good to have me. Thank you. Um, with, with that, we will turn our program to uh, Steve McInerney on the Project for Middle East Democracy to introduce the esteemed panelist. And we thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, and thanks very much to the Senator for your remarks and for your continued efforts uh, and, and interest and concern with uh, events in Bahrain. Um, you know, as the Senator said, uh, you know, I think this is a very important time to be looking at these issues. Um, this coming Tuesday will be the one-year anniversary of the mass protest movement that began last year on the 14th of February. Um, there are a lot of uh, concerning signs about the state of things now in Bahrain, and there are a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of worries that things may escalate in the days ahead, particularly around the time of uh, this one-year anniversary. Um, in addition to the uh, litany of abuses uh, that the Senator mentioned um, that were outlined by the BICI uh, that issued its report in November, uh, the same report also uh, included a, a very long list of recommendations uh, for the Bahraini government. And I think one of the important things to do is, is take stock and examine, um, you know, what progress has been made. Um, you know, there's, Senator Wyden mentioned that there has been progress made in some areas. Um, we have a great, great panel of speakers here that will help us kind of dig a little more, more closely into, um, you know, what progress has been made, what recommendations have been implemented, and, and what key recommendations uh, remain that need to be implemented. Uh, those recommendations, in, in, you know, addressed a, a variety of, you know, important issues in Bahrain, including uh, the detention, continued detention, prosecution of uh, Bahraini citizens for expressing uh, their, their rights, you know, to, to free expression and assembly, um, recommendations on the reform of the policies and practices of the security forces in Bahrain, um, addressing concerns regarding media incitement, uh, the rebuilding of religious institutions, uh, the reinstatement of uh, dismissed and terminated employees and, and students, uh, um, um, among many others. Uh, so I, you know, I think it's important for us to, to take stock in, uh, at this time ahead of you know, what could be a potentially um, explosive uh, week or, or month ahead of us. Um, in addition, um, there was a, you know, Senator Wyden mentioned the fact that uh, numerous uh, in, Representatives of organizations, human rights organizations, and other NGOs have been denied access to Bahrain. Um, more recently, just this week, uh, quite a number of international journalists that were hoping to return to Bahrain uh, to cover this one-year anniversary and um, you know, re report on the development over the next week uh, have been denied access as well. And, and that, that, you know, we just had news just in the last few days of an, uh, a, a long list of international journalists that have been denied access once again, um, which uh, again raises concerns uh, about what we may see uh, in the next week and you know, the government's uh, refusal to cooperate with journalists that are trying to uh, um, you know, help draw attention to these concerns in Bahrain. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce the three uh, excellent speakers that we have uh, to discuss these issues in more detail. Um, our first speaker will be Jos Selterman, who is the Deputy Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. He's also a research affiliate at MIT's Center for International Studies, um, and he was previously the Executive Director of the Arms Division of Human Rights Watch. Uh, uh, after that, our second speaker will be Elliot Abrams, who's currently a Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations 
uh, and he also uh, teaches U.S. foreign policy at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Uh, during the Bush administration, he served in a variety of positions at the Bush uh, administration White House, including Deputy National Security Advisor for Global Democracy Strategy and Senior Director of the National Security Council for Near East and North African Affairs. Um, and then our final, final speaker will be Colin Call. Uh, Colin Call is currently an Associate Professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and also a Senior Fellow at the Center for New American Security. Um, he just, uh, uh, until December, he was uh, at the Pentagon serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, uh, in which, in, in that capacity, he developed and implemented the Defense Department's strategy and policy uh, toward uh, the Middle East and North Africa, in, including uh, Bahrain. Uh, so we'll, we're excited to have his perspective, uh, having been in the administration until very recently and, and worked very closely on, on these issues. Uh, so thanks very much, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Joost. Mm -hmm. uh, as you like. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Joost Tiltemann of the International Crisis Group. Um, we, have, uh, we are a conflict prevention organization, nonprofit, and uh, our reports are available at uh, uh, www.crisisgroup.org. Uh, there are two reports on Bahrain that you will find uh, published in two, uh, 2011 uh, that uh, uh, analyze the, um, uh, the uprising and the crackdown that followed it. So I want to talk uh, briefly about uh, the uh, development since then. Uh, and especially about the Basuni report that uh, Senator Wyden already referred to, um, and uh, sort of the impact of that and, uh, uh, and what is happening now. Um, the, uh, after the uprising and the crackdown, uh, there was a lot of international pressure uh, on Bahrain to uh, end the crackdown, um, and the uh, government proceeded to take some steps under that pressure uh, to reverse some of the things that it had, uh, some of the uh, human rights abuses it had committed, um, early on, it first uh, lifted the emergency law uh, already in June. Um, it started a national dialogue, or it held a national dialogue in the summer, uh, which basically was a media circus. It didn't uh, amount to anything. It organized by elections to elect uh, new uh, parliamentarians for the uh, opposition parliamentarians who had uh, left parliament uh, in the spring. Um, uh, and these elections were, were boycotted by, by the opposition. And really, those three um, um, uh, actions didn't amount to much of anything, uh, though it was a welcome thing that the emergency law was lifted. However, none of the uh, serious abuses that had occurred uh, were, were reversed, and um, uh, none of the people in prison, uh, or very few of the people in the prison, certainly not the top people, uh, were released at the time. The only hopeful uh, element at the time was the announcement that there would be a commission of inquiry, an independent one, headed by a noted uh, uh, independent scholar, uh, Sharif Basuni, uh, of the United States and of Egypt, um, and that uh, this study would, uh, would have, uh, uh, you know, free uh, opportunity to investigate uh, the entire uh, events uh, of the spring. This uh, uh, commission, uh, which uh, in, in, uh, comprised uh, other senior uh, human rights officials, uh, international ones, uh, came out with, it, with what I have to say was an excellent report in November. An exhaustive study, over 500 pages long, very thoroughly, uh, uh, very thorough inf investigation uh, of the events of February and March of 2011. And it documented um, at, in great detail uh, the use of excessive force by security forces leading to uh, death uh, during demonstrations and, and, out, and outside of, uh, uh, as well, um, that led to uh, torture uh, in prisons. It also documented uh, consistent abuse of, of the, the uh, uh, freedom of expression um, that Bahrainis uh, theoretically have. It documented the destruction of uh, Shiite uh, houses of worship, um, and on and on. Uh, it uh, talked about media freedoms and how they had been violated and how uh, state uh, uh, media outlets had been manipulated uh, for sectarian ends, and so on. It also, and that's important uh, on the political front, it found no evidence of any kind of Iranian hand uh, behind uh, the, the protests that had taken place. Most importantly, perhaps, uh, the uh, report uh, issued a number of uh, recommendations, Senator Wyden already mentioned that, um, and these recommendations uh, 
were expected to be uh, implemented by the government. Well, the government, and I have to also again echo uh, Senator Wyden here, um, responded, uh, first of all, it, it invited the commission to operate uh, in Bahrain, and then the king did accept the, the conclusions to be presented in front of him in public, um, and these were, these were rather embarrassing uh, conclusions, I would say. So he accepted that to, to, to occur in front of him in Bahrain in November. And it has then taken steps to implement these recommendations. Now, if we listen to the Bahraini government, uh, it will say it has done the following. First of all, it has set up a commission of implementation. That's always a first good step. It has also started a website, and you can go there, and it encourages people to visit it. It's govactions.bh, and I would also encourage you to visit it. Um, you, there you will see uh, a number of uh, uh, actions that, that have been taken or are in the process of being taken. And it's up to us to judge the significance of these actions. They include um, legislative amendments to bring Bahraini law uh, in line with international human rights law and standards. Um, we haven't seen any concrete results from that yet, but um, if that were to happen, that would be a useful first step. There's no question about that. In the end, it is all about implementation of the law, enforcement of the law, and not just having the law on the books, of course. But uh, in, in any case, uh, bringing it in line with international regulations is, is a useful first step. The government is also bringing in international experts. It already uh, has uh, contracted with a number of well-known international expert, uh, experts in Bahrain to help it uh, in uh, institutional reform, human rights reform, police reform. This also is useful, uh, but in the end, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and we have to see what actually that reform will amount to. Um, the government has said it has reinstated a number of uh, public sector employees who were dismissed for their uh, right to exercise, uh, sorry, for, for, the, for exercising their right to freedom of, of expression, participating in the demonstrations. Um, a number of them have, in fact, been uh, reinstated, the, the, uh, but not always under in the same jobs or with the same job conditions. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the private sector employees who were dismissed have not uh, been uh, reinstated. Um, and we're talking about a total number of over 4,000 uh, of employees, both private and public sector, who were uh, dismissed at the time and on an ongoing basis. Um, the government has also said that it has ordered a civilian review by civilian judges of uh, convictions issued by the State Security Court. Uh, that is also uh, a welcome. Of course, all these convictions should be overturned. Uh, and if there is any evidence uh, of uh, criminal wrongdoing by anyone uh, accused, uh, then uh, these cases should be tried in the civilian courts. Um, it, the government has also said it, has, uh, it will open uh, relations with the human rights community. Um, well, uh, that is a promise. Um, of course, uh, we've already heard that in the implementation so far, this is not happening. Human rights first. PHR, Physicians for Human Rights, have been barred. Human Rights Watch tells me that uh, they have been told not to try until next month, meaning after this month when they, the government is expecting uh, 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 an escalation in, in demonstrations. Um, and so, again, the proof of the pudding it will be in the eating. Uh, reinstatement of students, another uh, uh, promise the government has made and has started to implement. It has also started to rebuild some of the mosques, though not all of the uh, houses of worship that have been uh, demolished. And it is also uh, talking about media reform. Of course, we've also just heard that journalists uh, have been barred. Uh, and again, I think it is because this is February and uh, the expectation that on the anniversary of the uprising there will be more trouble. So we'll have to see uh, what, this hap what this means in the longer term. I think all of these steps, promised or and, and in the process of being implemented, are welcome moves. We should not say that these are that we should not denounce these moves as as, as uh, useless. I think uh, these are important first steps. These are necessary steps, but they're also clearly insufficient, far insufficient. Um, and for two reasons, I think first of all, what the what the regime what is doing is 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 embarking on a on a charm offensive that is aimed primarily at the international community. Um, they are talking to us, to you, and to me. 
to, uh, to, to, the, to the United States, to Britain and France, and to others uh, that have a role in, the inter in Bahrain. Also, maybe to the Formula One organizers uh, and others who have uh, boycotted uh, Bahrain for the past year. Um, they want to change international policy. Why do I think they're talking only to us? Well, they're making a big thing about bringing in international experts and to give credibility to these efforts. I would also note that the website that I mentioned, govactions.bh, is in English. It's not in Arabic. Who are they talking to? They're talking to us. They're not talking to the people who are actually affected by these uh, changes. Secondly, the reforms are so far, and again, I'm echoing uh, Senator Wyden here, focused only on uh, the recommendations in the Bastioni report. The Bastioni report focused only on the human rights situation. These are human rights reforms. Even in focusing on human rights, they don't go far enough. They do not, some of the key figures who were arrested during the uprising are still in prison, including Ibrahim Sharif, one of the, leader, one, uh, of the party leaders. There has been no accountability for the crimes committed, except some very low-level uh, police officers have, have been uh, put on trial. But no senior officials have been uh, disciplined or punished in other ways for, uh, their, uh, for giving orders. Uh, and clearly, there was a, a strategy, there was a policy uh, to punish people by, through the use of excessive force, torture, and whatnot. Uh, so no accountability, zero accountability. There has been no significant police reform. Now, again, there are a couple of uh, well-known police commissioners in Bahrain working on this, but mostly they are working on sort of rules of engagement, and I don't want to downplay that. That is important. Um, they're working uh, on, on human rights awareness. Again, I'm all for it. This has to happen. But what they're not talking about is composition of the security forces and recruitment, because the problem has been that the regime has been bringing in uh, Sunnis in particular, uh, and, and, and people from outside Bahrain, from Pakistan, from Syria, from Jordan, uh, to staff the security forces and turn them into a sectarian weapon against the mass of the demonstrators, and the mass of the demonstrators are Shia, uh, because that community has been disenfranchised over the decades. And so I think it's very important that police reform, security, force, security sector reform, address the composition of the uh, uh, security forces. And finally, and not least, the uh, absence of political reform. Uh, the effort has been on human rights, but not really on the, on the issues that have riled um, uh, Bahrain from the beginning. If these uh, promised changes are, in fact, implemented, we'll end up something close to the status quo ante of, say, uh, f early February 2011. You know, close to, because clearly those who died cannot be brought back to life. Those who've been tortured, that torture cannot be undone. There can be compensation offered, and again, the government is offering some compensation to some victims, apparently, um, but uh, a lot has happened that cannot be undone. At the same time, even if this all is implemented, we're going to come back to a situation that was unsustainable in the first place, uh, and, and, and that led to the uprising in the first place. And so what is, what, what is needed? What is needed, in addition to these steps that are now being taken, that can help build confidence, if they do that, I'm not sure, but they could do that. That is important, but what we need is political steps. First of all, we need a resumption of the dialogue that broke down uh, in last March. Um, and it can start from the Crown Prince's seven points, seven principles. We need to see accountability at senior levels uh, for what happened uh, during the crackdown. We need institutional reform, and we need especially reform of the electoral law, because the electoral law is jury-rigged to benefit one community against another. And we need uh, active steps through the judici judiciary uh, against corruption. At this point, I expect little change, little effective, meaning, little effective or meaningful change. So far in Bahrain, with the polarization that has happened, uh, everything is a zero-sum game. It's one community against another. Um, how do you break through this? Well, with great difficulty. The international community can help. But Bahrain is also locked into a, a regional struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran. This is not going to change unless there is a real game changer in the region, which could happen, but it wouldn't necessarily be a positive one for the region. Uh, the United States can play a role in this, but I'm not going to talk about that because I have, there are two other experts on this table who can address this much more adequately than, than I can. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Joost. Uh, turn to Elliot. Thanks. <clears throat> 
Thank you. That was a um, terrific uh, analysis, and I thank you for that. I will talk a little bit about um, the American role and, and uh, <clears throat> how this all began. Um, some of the developments that we now call the Arab Spring have uh, filled me, at least, with hope, some with far less hope, but none has been as uh, disappointing as the and depressing as the developments in Bahrain. And one way of addressing it, I think, is to say, <clears throat> what did you think was going to happen? What did you want to see? What did you expect to see in Bahrain? Um, at the risk of appearing naive about the conditions there and about, for example, the Sunni fear of Iranian influence and indeed about the fears of all the uh, communities. Uh, here's an answer. I had thought that the desire for a greater role in the affairs of the nation by the many <clears throat> citizens of Shia faith was not going to be impossible to meet. I thought it would be possible for responsible Shia community leaders to acknowledge and explain to their own community that there would be progress toward constitutional monarchy, but it would be slow and steady progress, not revolutionary progress. I thought the king would at some point recognize that you have to bend or you break. And I thought that he would at some point assert himself, ultimately, though not instantly, by replacing the prime minister whose continued power in that position has made progress impossible. I, I thought the crown prince would not end up being entirely sidelined and basically silenced. I thought even the prime minister might be forced to see that mere repression would be uh, disastrous in the long run, not because he would become converted to liberalism, but because he would make a tough calculation about power and longevity. I thought perhaps the Saudis and Emiratis would conclude that monarchies can last only so long as they are legitimate. And that legitimacy in Bahrain, as in Kuwait, for example, requires some sharing of power between the royal family and the people. Oh well, none of this has happened unless perhaps it is the formation of the commission and the acceptance, formal acceptance of its recommendations by the king personally. There is also some, has been some effort by responsible Shia leaders to meet the king halfway. Uh, some people deny that. Um, I've spoken to some US officials who pretty much deny that, many Arab officials. Um, many people claim that the irresponsible decisions of the royal family have been matched by those of the Shia leadership. Even if that is so, one has to say that only one side is jailing and beating the other. Uh, it's very hard for equilibrium to be maintained in those circumstances. Obviously, what should have happened here is the government should have made partners out of the Shia middle class, the professional and commercial communities. In fact, in a sense, they have long been partners for decades and decades in maintaining the independence and prosperity and stability of the country. But this time, the government's forces have gone after, especially gone after, people like doctors and have made Sunni versus Shia a deeper dividing line than ever in Bahrain's history. And that is obviously tragic. From the royal family's point of view, I would have said it is also uh, quite dangerous and profoundly foolish. Now, as to the U.S. role, I, I cannot prove that greater American pressure could have prevented all or some of this right at the start, but that is my view. When I was in government, we had a very close relationship with the Bahraini government and military, including the king. Either, I think, over the last year, either the U.S. failed to use our influence, failed, that is, to push the government of Bahrain hard enough, or our influence declined somehow between 2008 and 2011. Um, we might have had to intervene very forcefully, diplomatically, 
because the countervailing pressures obviously were very great. We have a huge amount at stake here, including the Fifth Fleet, and more generally our own reputation as either principled supporters of democracy or hypocrites. I don't see evidence of the degree of involvement and pressure that I would have liked to see. Uh, but if I'm wrong, that is also a sad story, because if we used all that pressure, it suggests that we simply had very little influence, very little influence, very little influence in Abu Dhabi or in Riyadh or in Manama. We are not to blame for the situation in Bahrain, that's clear, but I am disappointed at our almost complete inability to ameliorate it. Now what? Well, um, as Senator Wyden said, and as we just heard, I would not abandon all hope. Uh, the Commission report does provide a possible meeting ground if it is used to offer real reconciliation. The King apparently will respond, uh, perhaps on February 14th, the anniversary of the date of the demonstrations, the beginning of the demonstrations. But any real offer must include an end, a real end to the violence. And I would say, frankly, if it's going to be serious, an end to the rule of the Prime Minister and his acolytes throughout the government. That is, the royal family needs to decide, and I think it has one good last chance for decision, to seek real reconciliation, or it's going to have to deal with reality that it alone, among all Arab ruling families, among all Arab monarchies, has lost legitimacy in the eyes of a majority of its people. Now, it may hang on for years and years, but the only way any illegitimate government hangs on by force would be the way it hangs on. That tragic outcome is still avoidable, I think, I hope, but if there's time left, there isn't much. Now, February 14th, that anniversary date, is, of course, also Valentine's Day. And if you look up the um, life of St. Valentine, you'll find that his very brief life story, there isn't much known about him, includes the story that he refused to deny Jesus Christ before the Emperor Claudius in the year 280, and he was executed. Before, however, before his head was cut off, this Valentine, perhaps of legend, restored sight and hearing to the daughter of his jailer. I sometimes wish someone would restore full sight and hearing to all the jailers in Bahrain, no matter how high-ranking, so they could truly understand the country's situation before it's too late. Thanks. Thanks very much, Elliot. And turn to Colin. Great. Well, uh, thank you for having me and for organizing uh, the event. Um, I'm Colin Call. I teach at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, and I'm a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security. Um, until recently, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, where I had uh, my portfolio included the 14 countries that span from Egypt up through Israel and the Levant to Iraq, Iran, down all the GCC states uh, to Yemen. So as I, I like to say, just the easy countries. Um, I, I, I want to make clear that I'm speaking today as an individual, uh, as an academic, uh, freed from government to speak my mind as an, as an individual. Uh, uh, and so nothing that I say should be uh, you know, attributed to the administration or reflective of the administration. But I do want to take some time to describe what I understand the administration's uh, policy to be towards Bahrain, with a special emphasis on the role of security assistance in that policy. And I think this will uh, tie uh, uh, closely into some of Senator Wyden's uh, comments. Uh, and also maybe address some of the criticisms that, that Elliot uh, raised. As I see it, the United States has two fundamental goals uh, in, in Bahrain at the moment. The first is reform, uh, political reform, uh, civil rights reform, human rights reform, largely along the lines that Senator Wyden and, uh, and Yost uh, out, outlined. Uh, I would totally agree with Yost that even if the government moves forward with the uh, independent commission's uh, recommendations and fully implements them, uh, this is a necessary but not a sufficient outcome. I think the administration shares uh, that view as well. This is important for both idealistic and real politic reasons. Idealistic because it's the right thing to do uh, it, uh, for human values, for uh, uh, American values, 
uh, but also for real politique reasons. Um, it's, it's difficult to conceive of Bahrain being stable over the long term with a 70% Shia uh, population if there's not meaningful political reform, full stop. They may be able to put their finger in a dike for a while, but eventually the dike will uh, explode uh, and uh, the thing and uh, situation will get worse. So one doesn't have to be a, a uh, you know, a Wilsonian uh, to uh, understand the importance of, of these reforms uh, to Bahrain. The second uh, uh, goal that we pursue, however, is partnership, and especially security partnership. Um, it's difficult to underestimate how important Bahrain is to the ability of the United States to project influence and, and balance uh, in the Middle East, and in particular in the Gulf. Uh, we have a considerable naval presence and air presence in Bahrain, uh, and there's probably no other country in the world that is more important to our ability to counter Iranian uh, influence uh, and potentially uh, Iranian military aggression in the Strait of Hormuz or elsewhere than Bahrain. We have a deep fundamental interest uh, uh, in terms of our national security, especially in the current context of rising tensions with Iran, to maintain a security partnership with Bahrain. So you have these two objectives, the reform objectives and the partnership objectives, and you have to navigate the two. I, I, I would, uh, you know, uh, Senator Wyden mentioned about, you know, the inability to have any exceptions, but at the end of his uh, remarks, he also noted that you have to take every country on its own merits, and I think what the administration has tried to do is uphold a set of principles, but to deploy them pragmatically, understanding the constraints uh, in any particular uh, place. So what gives us influence? You know, Elliot talked a lot about whether we uh, have tried to use our influence and whether it's, it's been enough. Um, I basically think our influence in most places, but certainly in Bahrain, comes from two uh, attributes. One is relationships, uh, access, trust. Do we have high-level officials who regularly meet with the king, who regularly meet with the crown prince, who have influence uh, over uh, important decision makers in uh, Bahrain? Do they trust us? Do they listen to us? Relationships and access matter because this is, these are the avenues ultimately for persuasion. And in this part of the world, in particular, relationships are essential. So first is, is relationships. The second is our assistance. Our assistance and cooperation, especially in the security domain, which arguably give us opportunities for leverage. Okay, so there's kind of a soft power dimension of relationships and influence and persuasion and a hard power dimension of our ability to, uh, to calibrate our assistance levels to generate leverage. All right? The problem is that you have to be careful in wielding the second, the stick, too brashly and too uncreatively or you risk destroying the relationships which ultimately give you the first form of influence. Right? And anybody who tells you otherwise hasn't looked at this part of the world uh, closely uh, enough. Which brings me to how big of a stick should we be wielding on, on Bahrain? Should we be cutting off all security assistance? Should we stop all military exercises with the Bahrainis, which are extensive? Should we pull the Fifth Fleet out of Bahrain, which you've seen uh, uh, some recommend on the editorial pages of uh, you know, such uh, uh, newspapers as the Washington Post? Should we do that? Well, a couple of things to keep in mind. You can only do that once. If you're going to threaten it, you better not bluff. And third, you need to realize it won't work. It won't work because the balance of stakes are not symmetrical. They're asymmetrical. For the Khalifa family and the monarchy, the stakes of the current crisis are existential. They're also existential for the Saudis. Okay? So as much as they value our security relationship, which they value immensely, as much as they require the Fifth Fleet for protection against Iran, which they value immensely, the stakes are not symmetrical. You could threaten to withdraw all assistance from Bahrain tomorrow, and they would say, okay, that's unfortunate. We'll see you later. If the requirement was that they would immediately transform into a constitutional monarchy and the Khalifa family would give up power, that's what you would get. You would get us wielding this threat, this big stick, and it would accomplish nothing. It might, more, it might feel good morally for about 24 hours until we realized that it accomplished nothing, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, we had to live with the strategic consequences of it as well. So as a result, you can't do it that way. Right? Whether you're an idealist or a realist, you can't do it that way. It's, it, it, whatever your principles are, you, if, if they can't be pragmatically implemented, it doesn't make any sense. So what is the, how is the administration trying to navigate these things as best as I understand it? And again, I'm not in the administration anymore, uh, and I'm not privy to the ongoing uh, conversations inside uh, the administration on this issue. But 
Basically, you can't communicate to the Bahrainis that we are committed to abandoning them. You can't. If you do it, you'll destroy the relationships and the access that give you uh, the ability to have any influence in the, in the first place. Instead, you have to lead with the second goal, which is partnership, and you have to basically make the following argument. Look, we share a multitude of common interests with Bahrain. We share a deep and abiding concern about Iran's destabilizing activities in the region, about Iran's nuclear ambitions. We have an enormous interest in making sure that the free flow of energy resources flows uh, through, uh, through the Gulf. We have an interest in maritime security, in ballistic missile defense, in counterterrorism. You name it, we have a host of common interests, and they largely center around Bahrain's external defense. All right? And nothing about the Arab Spring has changed that dimension. All right? However, one of the common interests we have, again, this is if, if you were speaking with King Hamid or the Crown Prince or the Prime Minister or the head of the BDF, one of those common interests is instability, and in our judgment, that requires genuine reform. We have a common interest in the stability uh, of Bahrain, so do you, and that requires reform, and what do we mean? It means expanded civil rights, which should be among the easiest steps for them to take, frankly, expanding uh, 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 civil service uh, uh, um, the ability of the Shia to serve in the civil service, in the security forces, uh, cutting down on media bias, uh, uh, cutting down on bias in housing. Uh, these are all steps which should be relatively easy for the government uh, to take. Improvements in transparency and accountability. Many of the independent commission uh, uh, recommendations speak uh, to that issue. Uh, security sector reform. Uh, and then ultimately better representation in the parliament for the majority of, of Bahraini uh, citizens. And a long-term transition towards a more empowered citizenry. But this will have to happen on Bahrain's terms and at Bahrain's pace. It's going to be a long road, but you need to get started. All right? And it's important not just because it's important to us, but it's because it's important to you, that ultimately it's the only pathway to stability, and we have to be making that argument to the Bahraini government. We have to be making that argument to the Saudis. We have to make that government to the, uh, to the Emiratis and others, uh, external actors who may have influence on, uh, on Bahrain. And my understanding is the administration has made uh, that argument over and over. We also need to emphasize to them that in the absence of reform, our vision of the future of Bahrain is periods of deep turmoil, and that that deep turmoil will make our partnership difficult to sustain. All right? It's kind of a soft conditionality as opposed to a hard conditionality. You don't threat, you don't say, tomorrow we're going to pull out the Fifth Fleet unless, unless you do these seven things. Instead, you make the argument that, that your stability is unsustainable, and therefore our partnership will be unsustainable if you continue on this road. So you can invoke their interests in having us there without threatening it in the moment. All right. These messages have been communicated at the highest levels of our government for more than a year. All right. I know this because the last time I was in Bahrain was in, on March 12th with Secretary Robert Gates. We landed. I sat in the meetings with the Crown Prince, with King Hamid, this was a very important moment, actually, in this entire uh, crisis. Jan uh, February 14th, of course, is the anniversary of the beginning of the uprising, but really it was March 15th that marks the turning point uh, in, in much of this. So in the conversations, you know, Gates, despite press, uh, uh, some press reporting in the Arab world, which suggested that we landed to basically give the Saudis a green light to invade Bahrain, um, that was actually not what we were there to do. Um, Gates was trying to push uh, the... the, the uh, the king to support the crown prince's initiative for a national referendum that would basically uh, uh, in, uh, allow them to instantiate whatever came of the national dialogue. Not the national dialogue that Yost ended up talking about, but the national dialogue that I think would have been more serious that the crown prince was proposing at the time. And the fact of putting the outputs of the national dialogue up for a national referendum is important given the 70 percent uh, uh, majority Shia population. So this was a meaningful uh, act. So we were there on the 12th to try to get uh, the king and the crown prince, uh, to, uh, uh, well, the king, on, uh, to, uh, to the yes point on that. And then Jeff Feltman was going to come in on Monday. Jeff Feltman, the assistant secretary of uh, state uh, for Near Eastern Affairs, was going to come in on Monday to try to get al Wafak, the major Shia moderate uh, uh, opposition party, uh, to take yes for an answer. That is, to get to the table on, on the national dialogue and move the process uh, forward. March 12th, March 14th. The problem was there was a day in between. That day was the most violent day of protest uh, in, uh, in uh, my understanding, is in the entire period uh, that we've experienced. There was violence on both sides. Uh, uh, Bahraini security forces used uh, inappropriate force. Uh, there were a lot of injuries to protesters. There were also a number of police who were run down uh, by protesters who had stole uh, police cars. Um, 
I think this burst of violence in the context of growing sectarianism gave the Saudis, uh, and to a lesser degree the Emiratis, a ra uh, the rationality to do what they did 36 hours later, which was to cross the causeway uh, into, into Bahrain. And what that did was it hardened the factions. It, it kind of closed off, at least for a period of time, the kind of rational space for compromise that I think Elliot appropriately identified. Um, and so we are where we are. All right. So the question is, uh, have we tried to use our influence? Yes. Then uh, uh, Elliot's point is, does that mean we have no influence? And the answer is, we don't have more or less influence than we had six years ago when Elliot was sitting in the White House. It's the asymmetry of stakes that explains why they don't, they don't do everything that we tell them to do. Okay? It's not whether our influence is higher or lower. It's that we don't always get our way. Right? So how are we trying to walk a tightrope of trying to maximize our, our relationships and, and leverage our assistance to try to get the Bahrainis to move further along this road, understanding that we have a long way to go? I will close with just a, a few remarks in this case largely as it relates to security assistance. As I understand it, the administration is drawing the distinction between security assistance, arms transfers, arms sales, for example, that relate to external defense and those that relate to internal security and therefore could be used to repress protesters. Okay? So the $1 million of assistance that's been in the news is aimed to provide maintenance and spare parts for things like aircraft and naval vessels that in, under no scenarios are going to be involved in the lethal application of force against protesters. But they are a signal of our continued commitment to the external defense of Bahrain. Meanwhile, holding in abeyance all security assistance that would allow for the expansion of external security capabilities and holding off on anything that would expand their internal security capabilities and therefore could be used for repressive purposes until such time as they, as they start to implement uh, and actually enforce uh, the uh, recommendations of the Independent Commission. So is this perfect? It most certainly is not. Is it morally the, uh, you know, uh, completely satisfying? I don't think it is. Most foreign policy decisions aren't. Um, but is it probably the only way to navigate uh, this particular type rope at the moment? I would argue that it is. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much to all of our speakers. Um, I, I'm going to open up the floor. We have about 25 minutes left. I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Uh, also, our, our staff here have been uh, sort of live tweeting this event uh, via Twitter, and we have a number of questions that have come in. Um, via Twitter, including from Bahrain, uh, for our panelists, and I'll, I will work those in uh, along with uh, the, qu the questions uh, here from the audience. Uh, so please, uh, if you raise your hand, we have a microphone that will come around, so please wait for that. Hi, I'm Andrew Harrod. I'm currently doing independent research for the Center of Equal Opportunity. Uh, you mentioned, it was mentioned here in the discussion, that February 14th is Valentine's Day, and in the history of the Islamic world, uh, February 14th also has the significance that in 1989, that was the day of uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa against Salman Rushdie's, his particular uh, valentine on Salman Rushdie at the time for his uh, authorship of the book, The Satanic Verses. I just wanted to hear commentary exploring more the uh, issue of, of the 70% Shia majority in Bahrain and what uh, consequences or fears people might have of similar developments in Bahrain akin to that in Iran. I mean, after all, in Iraq, we've now sacrificed considerable blood and treasure, some 4,500 American lives in a democracy project there. And now there's uh, criticism rising that the Shia majority there is starting to engage in, under uh, Prime Minister Mal uh, Maleki against various uh, repressive measures uh, against other populations in Iraq, such as the Christians or the Sunni. Uh, Arab minority. So uh, I would like to hear continue uh, some more discussion about uh, possible uh, what role the Shias would play and what for, uh, prospects there are for any success in democratic reform in Bahrain. Thanks. I think we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll uh, give each panelist a chance to respond. Yes, here in the center. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Stern. I'm a graduate student at George Washington University. And we've talked a lot about American influence in Bahrain, but I'd like to talk about other countries who are trying to also exert their leverage. And in the past couple of days, we've seen a lot of reports about strengthening Saudi Bahraini ties, and even reports that the king of Bahrain has, quote, sold Bahrain to Saudi. So if you could talk about the Saudi influence in the country, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll go 
down the row here. Hi, I'm Claudette from Senator Wyden's office. I actually just wanted to clarify with Mr. Carl. So do you agree with the administration at the moment that the $1 million um, sales for external affairs is at the moment the right thing to do? do you, I was just wondering if you thought that perhaps we should void it altogether because especially considering there is that emphasis on the message that we're sending. I do see what you were saying about the tightrope, but I just wanted to see specifically that point be clarified. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll stop there for the moment and we'll have another round in a few minutes. And to, to those questions, let me add a couple that have uh, come in uh, via Twitter. Um, we, we have a, a question uh, about you know, a possible double standard uh, that the U.S. has currently uh, regarding the situation in, in Syria and Bahrain. Um, and I, I would mention that there was a Washington Post editorial on Tuesday that, that draw a comparison between the two and talked about the, the credibility um, of, you know, it, it commended the, the, and sympathized with the Obama administration's criticism of Russian arms sales uh, to Syria, uh, noting that the, and, uh, the Russians uh, more than once have, have um, ma offered a defense similar to, to what uh, Colin mentioned here, that, that the, the arms that the Russians are selling now to Syria are not being used for internal repression and uh, compared that with the, uh, the sort of recent small arms sale uh, to Bahrain. Uh, so that's one question that has come in. Um, and then there was also a question about what new policies uh, are being developed, uh, what uh, other options might the U.S. have uh, for involvement in relations with countries uh, that are persisting with human rights violations. Um, I, we heard, a, I think, a, a very insightful and thorough description of the administration's ongoing policies. Um, but, you know, I'd like to hear, you know, suggestions or thoughts from any of the three panelists about what other options uh, might be available in the event that in the weeks and months ahead uh, the existing policies don't uh, result in more progress than we've seen up till now. Uh, so let me start with Joost. Um Yeah, I will not address all of those, but um, <coughs> I can talk about the, the one on Saudi influence and uh, maybe talk a little bit about Iraq Shiites, but very briefly because this is an event on Bahrain and not <coughs> an event on Bahrain and not on... Iraq. The, um, the issue of Saudi influence, I mean, Saudi influence in Bahrain is extensive. Um, the Khalifa family originally is from the uh, peninsula a couple of centuries ago, um, and, uh, the, uh, and Bahrain remains, uh, uh, you know, umbilically linked to uh, the mainland, I would say, uh, through the causeway uh, that uh, goes to the, um, to the uh, eastern province. And economically, through the oil economy, uh, Bahrain and, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia are very, very closely linked. I would also say that, you know, Bahrain with a majority Shiite population being linked so closely to the eastern province, which has maybe 50% Shiite population, is also very significant because those are very close familial ties between the two communities. Uh, they're talking all the time. This is, uh, this is really, uh, you know, very proximate. The... Um, the, uh, the issue of Saudi influence is such that uh, I have not met any uh, opposition uh, leaders or people in, in Bahrain who, who don't believe that this is not the way it will be in the future. They accept Saudi the Saudi presence. What they don't accept is the Saudi military presence, of course. But they, there, there is no talk of Bahrain somehow, you know, splitting off from the Saudi uh, sphere of influence. Um, Iran doesn't provide uh, a viable alternative f for them, the way they talk anyway. Um, and I think, objectively speaking, it doesn't make any sense. So um, for, for, from their perspective, uh, to call for political reforms in no way suggests that Iran would suddenly take over Bahrain. However, that is not the view from, from Riyadh or from uh, the government in Manama. Uh, there the view is that, in fact, that any net loss, and this again, this is why it's a zero-sum game, that any net loss to the protesters through political reforms will, in fact, automatically lead not only to the downfall of the regime, but to Bahrain falling within the Iranian orbit. So, um, you know, these are the perspectives that are out there. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, it is almost a given that uh, uh, Bahrain will uh, remain tightly interwoven with uh, the larger Gulf region on the Arab side. It's, a, it's an Arab country. Um, on Iraq Shiites, again, I don't want to talk much about it. I just want to make clear that the Shiites of Bahrain are not the Shiites of Iraq. These are two separate countries, two separate uh, uh, political entities with their own political parties, their own uh, ambitions, um, their own problems. 
um, uh, but that generally, um, to the extent that we now see a rise of sectarian polarization throughout the uh, the Mashrek, the, 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 the Arab Middle East, um, uh, we, we'll see problems not only in Bahrain and in Iraq, but also in Syria, possibly in Lebanon uh, and, and in other parts of the Gulf. And so it's a very dangerous situation we're facing, actually. And it's very important to uh, bring the parties back to the table and to tone down the sectarian rhetoric and some of the clearly sectarian policies that are being pursued. Thank you. First on the uh, arms sale. Um, I would not oppose the $1 billion arms sale if it were preceded by a full explanation of what we were doing. Uh, unfortunately, what we have not had is the kind of explanation that Colin gave. That is, if we would say to the people of Bahrain, we have to explain to the people of the United States too, but if we would say to the people of Bahrain, here's why this one is okay, because it is maintaining external capabilities and will have no influence whatsoever on the internal uh, repressive capabilities. And if it would, if it, if it had that, we wouldn't do it. But I don't think we have really explained that fully. In fact, on the contrary, uh, initially it looked as if the administration was trying to sneak this one by after the $53 million sale was blocked. That's a very bad way of going about this, which is just going to make everybody <laughs> in Bahrain and in Congress uh, mistrustful and annoyed. Um, I, I just I wanted to state, I guess, a disagreement also, because I don't think the problem is asymmetry. It is, of course, true that there is an asymmetry. We care about Bahrain, but the Bahrainis care about it more, and the Al Khalifa uh, obviously care about their longevity more than anybody else cares about their longevity. That's not the problem. The problem is that your excellent argument, which I think was the right argument and was very well stated, didn't make a sale. That's the problem. I mean, what we were saying to the Al-Khalifa was, here's the path to your longevity. Here's the path to survival, guys. Uh, and I think, I think everybody on this panel thinks it, it's the right argument. It's a, it is a real politique argument. But they rejected it. So the question then becomes, how come? Why were we unpersuasive? Um, lack of the kind of relationships that we should have had with the king, for example, or some other uh, leaders of the family, uh, the fact that we were unable to persuade the Saudis to butt out uh, or butt in less, uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that. But what is clear is, uh, to me, we have an argument that is actually right and that is in the long run best interest, not only of the country, uh, but even of the royal family, but we were unable to make a sale. What can be done? You know, with every passing month, the situation becomes more difficult. People get more dug in, as in Syria. Uh, as the violence continues, the ability to achieve reconciliation is more difficult. I had one thought last year uh, in the spring. It may be too late. The thought then was, since the two sides appear to be unable to uh, work this out together, maybe a third party is needed. Uh, in, there have been cases where you've had um, people like, uh, little groups of people like Kofi Annan, Marty Atasari, other international leaders, some actually linked to the crisis group, who have been able to serve as conveners of a conversation that's actually been uh, productive. Whether that is still possible a year later, I think, um, is, is uh, unclear. So a couple of things. I do actually want to make one comment on the Sh on the Shia uh, issue. You know, the Shia of Bahrain, uh, the 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 view sometimes among uh, Sunnis in Bahrain, especially among the royal family and among the Saudis, is that of course the Shia are all beholden to Iran. Uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, in the intel community once joked that the the the, uh, the Saudis see a, a, a an Iranian under every rock, and now they see the Iranians as the rocks. Uh, uh, but of course, as the Independent Commission showed, there was, there was no Iranian involvement in the actual uh, uh, uprising, although Iran certainly has tried to exploit the uprising. And that's a very important point. If, you know, the Shia of Bahrain are, are their own people. 
If anything, they actually look more to the Shia of Iraq, especially to uh, the leadership in Najaf for inspiration, not to Iran. But the more this, this conflict becomes radicalized, mm -hmm. and be more, the more it, is, it becomes defined as a sectarian conflict between the Saudis on the one hand and Iran on the other hand, the more the, the Iranians will have opportunities to exploit the radicalization of the Shia in Bahrain, full stop. It's another one of these real politic arguments for why the Khalifa family has an interest if their interest is in maintaining uh, uh, stability and keeping the Iranians out, they have an interest in reform. That, that, that's uh, an argument. Certainly, it's an argument that the administration uh, has been making. On the $1 million, look, my understanding is the State Department did offer an explanation. Uh, now, whether they should have done it before or after, or whether it was sneaked through or not, I'll let others uh, uh, decide. But they did offer an explanation that was identical to mine. That is that these are not uh, for internal security, they're for maintaining, I mean, sorry, not for internal security, they're for maintaining current external defense, not even expanding, but maintaining current external de uh, uh, defense. My understanding of, I, it was actually not that the administration tried to sneak this by, but that folks came up to the Hill and briefed on the broad framework of this, and those briefings leaked, and that that's how this uh, came. Uh, but I'll leave it to you all to decide whether that's how it happened uh, or not, but my understanding was it wasn't a sneak by uh, by the administration. In fact, the administration was trying to be candid with Congress and uh, stuff got into the news. Uh, uh, in any case, one would have to make the argument that cutting off that $1 million would make any difference. All right? And I just don't think it would. And I think that the line, and I'm actually more worried that signaling total abandonment would be a bigger problem as it relates to our influence. And this actually speaks to, I think, a problem that Elliot has in, the, in, the, in his last remarks. He said, well, if we were making all these arguments, why didn't it work? Well, it didn't work because in March, the entire, uh, all, the, all the Gulf monarchies were petrified that the United States was about to throw them under the bus. They saw Mubarak's fall, and they were afraid that we were going to throw them under the bus. And, those, and the folks who were especially afraid were the Saudis. All right? And the Saudis saw Bahrain as a doubly existential crisis. One, existential in the sense that a revolution in Bahrain could spill over into the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia, creating an existential threat to the kingdom. And two, that, that Bahrain was a firewall against Iranian influence and, their, and the exaggerated notion of Iranian influence in the Gulf. So I think they, in an ill-advised fashion, planted the flag against both of those by intervening on, on, March, on March 15th. Our inability... I think at the time, uh, to both get the Khalifa family to yes in time to head off this and to get the Saudis not to go in, were indicative, I think, of this asymmetry of stakes that I talked about before. Right? But I also think they tell another lesson, which is sending signals of complete abandonment to these countries don't get them to yes. That's the lesson I draw from it. You, so you have, to split the, you have to split the difference. You have to assure them in our partnership so they have a stake in that partnership moving forward while still arguing that our support to them is not unconditional. Right? And I know that that's not morally satisfying, but I don't know any other, any other solution that will work. And if, if somebody has an argument about how withholding a million uh, uh, dollars worth of spare parts for aircrafts will make Bahrain a constitutional monarchy tomorrow or make them implement police reform, I'm open to that argument. I just haven't seen any evidence of that. Thanks. I just want to add one thing. I, yeah, sure. I, I don't, uh, it may be that the um, U.S. government uh, made some kind of explanation of this million-dollar thing, you know, by the spokesman at the State Department in the noon briefing. That's not what I mean by explaining it to the American people and to the people of Bahrain. I mean something much larger uh, than that, where, where the speaker is, for example, the Secretary of State, where you make a real effort at communication, not dropping something in the noon briefing. Uh, and in thinking through how we, we try to move a positive agenda, one of the fears that I have, we have, is that the moderate dialogue partners are being undermined, specifically the trade unions in the country are being specifically undermined by the government now. Uh, we, uh, the AFL-CIO, filed a complaint under the free trade agreement to give us some leverage in that area. Um, what signal does it send when we don't take that process seriously, especially when the trade unions have probably been among the most interested in dialogue? They have, obviously have to find a partner on the other side of the equation. And what can we do to help them find that partner on the other side of the equation? So right here in the center. Uh, my name is Greg Aftandilian. I'm with the Center for National Policy. 
Uh, my question deals with uh, heightened tensions between U.S. and Iran and how that impacts U.S. policy towards Bahrain. Um, because, you know, the tensions are increasing between U.S. and Iran, doesn't this give the Bahraini government more leverage because we're so dependent on having our fifth fleet there in case of uh, hostilities between the U.S. and Iran? So the leverage issue seems to be now in favor of the Bahraini government. If anybody could comment on that, thank you. I'm Sarah Trister with Freedom House. Um, I wanted to uh, address Mr. Call. It, if you accept the idea, as I believe you just did, that kind of this dialogue and pressure that the United States has been um, using towards Bahrain has been unsuccessful, um, but you also argue that using military assistance is not the proper leverage, what are you left with? Um, to uh, try to influence this situation to some kind of positive resolution. And if I could make one comment, and then I'll turn it back to the speakers. <laughs> On this discussion of you know, leverage and influence and, and the arms deal and other things, um, you know, one factor that I think hasn't really come up that hasn't been really addressed is um, the impact and, uh, of the U.S. relationship with the bah Bahraini people and the perception of the Bahraini people. And you know, I, I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, you know, our relationship with the Bahraini government. I think one of the lessons, hopefully, of the Arab Spring, you know, across the region in the past year, is that, you know, we should maybe be more concerned uh, not only with bilateral relationships with governments, but also uh, with, with populations. And so if, uh, if anyone has comments or reactions to that, uh, in addition to these questions and any uh, closing comments, so if you know, turn to each of you for a couple of minutes. Yes. Um, all right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, it is because of uh, complaints filed by, by the AFL-CIO and, and uh, uh, similar actions undertaken by various institutions that the uh, Bahraini government is doing anything at all and is, you know, went through this uh, exercise with the Bashuni, Bashuni Commission and uh, is starting to implement some of it. So I think, you know, anything that can be done on that score to keep up the pressure um, is extremely useful because there, seem, there seems to be a response. That's the only response we've seen so far from the Bahraini government. Um, so, um, but whether it, whether it will lead to dialogue, we'll have to see. But that, that is going to be the litmus test, I think. Um, the dialogue is, is and that's, well, that's only the first step toward reform, of course, but we haven't even gone back to dialogue. Um, but I would like to think that um, you know the the, 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 peop the, the the people who were the crown prince and and Al Bifaq and and so the, the licensed political parties that came together back in February and March to uh, to talk to each other and to to move forward on on serious reforms that effort uh, failed and those groups now the crown prince on his side the Al Bifaq and others have been marginalised in view of you know with the, the, the crown prince within the royal family Al Bifaq within the sort of the larger community of the opposition including. The street protesters, you know, their standing is, is much diminished. Um, they need to be uh, re reinforced. Um, and that can only happen if the, if the regime actually makes tangible changes for people. Um, that would give ammunition to these, uh, that's maybe the wrong word, but to, to the moderates in the center to get back together and to actually have a position from which they can negotiate. So, but that's a slow building process. In the wider context, this is, looks very difficult now because I totally agree with the argument uh, that uh, U.S. leverage is, is diminished at the moment because uh, one thing that the U.S. and the government of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia have in common is their animosity toward Iran. And if, in fact, there is going to be a war between the United States and Iran, and heaven forbid, but if this were to happen, it would be a disaster for the region, but, and certainly it won't be any good for the people of Bahrain because I think uh, it will just mean that Saudi Arabia will even further clamp down uh, uh, and, and through the, uh, the government of Bahrain, the Bahrain, I should say, the government of Bahrain will further clamp down with Saudi support on, uh, on the protesters in, in Bahrain and on the Shia population in Bahrain. So um, the, the situation at the moment doesn't look good. I think regional tensions have to come way down how that's going to happen uh, with the unresolved issue of Iran's nuclear program, with the, the Syria crisis uh, deteriorating, not getting better, I'm not sure. Um, some of the other questions I think I'm going to leave uh, to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, I'm, I'm not sure that regional tensions have to come down uh, for there to be progress in Bahrain. I think that the uh, Bahraini government and other interested local parties, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, 
have to have more confidence about the situation in the region. That could be in a situation of tension or lack of tension. But a relevant feature here is their sense, however wrong we may think it is, um, that, as Colin said, we, you know, that, that, that we've thrown them under the bus. We don't care about their future. Their future is in doubt. We are ceding leadership in the region to Iran. To the extent that they believe that, uh, reform in Bahrain, in Bahrain is uh, much more difficult. To the extent that they come to realize it is not true, um, it perhaps gives them a greater sense of... Uh, Flexibility. One final point uh, on the um, military aid. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm about to defend you. I don't think that Colin said, and I would certainly not say, that military aid is not in the mix. It's one thing to say that the million dollars should or should not be given. It's another thing to say that the full $53 million package should have been given, uh, which, which would, I think, be a, a real mistake in part because it contained... Uh, some things that would be useful for internal repression. So I think uh, all of our assistance to Bahrain uh, it should be on the table, and particularly the military assistance, and it is on the table. So a couple of things on the, you know, do the events, uh, uh, the tensions between the United States uh, and Iran, Israel and Iran, the, the, the broader regional milieu, does that actually reduce our leverage because we, uh, we you know, are so dependent on the Fifth Fleet uh, to counter those threats that we wouldn't threaten to pull them away? Um, well, at the moment, we're not threatening to pull them away, and even in the absence of these tensions, it's hard to see how threatening to pull them away would be effective. So it probably does marginally reduce our leverage if we were willing to make that threat, but I don't know that that threat would work anyway. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure it washes it, uh, it, it uh, you know, on the scorecard, it, it overwhelmingly reduces our leverage. What I do think it does, though, is that the, that the tensions uh, increasing with Iran and the increasingly sectarian character of the competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran in this part of the world, I do think increases the importance of us being able to provide some external security assurance to the countries of the Gulf because they're unlikely to make domestic changes, which they view as providing windows of opportunity for Iranian-backed subversion. They're unlikely to make domestic changes unless they have some confidence against Iranian threats externally. So I think you have to provide them some external assurance to have any hope of domestic uh, reform, which is which brings us to the question of what to do now, right? I wasn't saying doing nothing. Actually, quite the contrary. We have to do steady, unrelenting arguments in favor of reform, both as the right thing to do as human beings and as the right thing to do from a real politic standpoint. If anything that I said led you to believe otherwise, uh, review the transcript. <laughs> uh, I think that it's enormously important. The administration has been extraordinarily clear uh, uh, on this and... Uh, uh, in any case, it's clear, slow and steady persuasion about the importance of, of reform, backed by calibrated leverage. The policy of the administration, as I understand it, is not to give a blank slate, to give you know, every weapon uh, under, under the sun. The argument is a very limited set of things which are necessary for maintaining existing external defense capabilities should go through because that provides some credibility to our external security assurance, while those that would enhance those capabilities or be uh, uh, able to be used for internal repression should not go through, All right? which strikes me as about the right balance. And if somebody's got a better methodology than, uh, other than just keeping it all off the table, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm open to listening uh, to it. Um, the other thing we can point out is that, look, we're a political place too, and over time, the absence of reform and the building turmoil in Bahrain will reach a certain point where our partnership with them will be politically unsustainable for us here. I think that all of us can admit that. That's an argument we need to continue to make. It's not the same as threatening tomorrow to pull out the Fifth Fleet. It says if things get worse and, or if things don't get better over time, it's going to be harder and harder for us to partner with you and hope that that affects uh, their calculations in favor of reform. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much to all of you for coming. Thanks to our speakers for a very insightful and interesting discussion. Uh, I'm not sure that it inspired a lot of optimism, but hopefully at least will help us frame and understand uh, the continuing developments in Bahrain uh, ahead. Uh, one announcement I want to make before you all go, um, sort of on an unrelated note. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have been following cl closely the, sort of the crisis in Egypt and the tensions uh, over the uh, you know, charges against uh, NGO staff, including U.S. citizens there. I was going to mention that our organization, uh, at the end of the day today, is going to publish, uh, we're going to release a sort of fact sheet about a 15-page document that will 
just kind of outline, I think there's been a lot of confusion over exactly, you know, the, what's unfolded over the last several months and what's brought us to this point. And so um, hopefully, you know, some of you may find that useful. If you're not already on our mailing list, uh, see me or one of my colleagues after the event. Thanks very much for coming and see you next time. Thanks. 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 Thanks.